As most people know who follow this channel, I have a pretty extreme love affair with my Triumph Daytona 675R. I have owned two of them so far and have been a pretty huge fanboy of the brand and bike for well over four years now. Following the success of my previous history videos, I wanted to do one about my favorite bike and trace its lineage from beginnings to the three-cylinder middleweight sport bike we know and love today. Also just wanted to let you guys know that we are doing another limited edition run of our Classic Gears t-shirt. You can check it out in the description below, in the comment below, or clicking the card up above. As always, the proceeds of this t-shirt are going to go to the charity of my favorite choosing, which is at this moment, the Limp Dick Wheelie Game Charity. It goes towards helping all those riders who cannot get it up. So get it while you can and while it lasts. Before jumping in, I think it's best to establish this video's focus. While I'd love to make a history video detailing Triumph's pretty bizarre twists and turns as a manufacturer dating back over a hundred years, that's a hundred years of rich history that I cannot possibly cover in this video. This video's focus is to trace the lineage of the Daytona. Alright, let's start. Triumph's original founder was a German immigrant to the UK who began a manufacturing company that originally was meant to specialize in bicycles, as it was in vogue at the time. By 1902, however, he decided that the bicycle craze was in full swing and it decided to do what everyone else was doing, add motors to those bicycles. We get the original Triumph motorcycle in 1902, and it was quite literally a bicycle with a motor strapped to it. Only decades later do we get something that resembles more closely what a motorcycle looks like today, but it's important to note the company's origins. Arguably one of the most important Triumphs ever built, the 1937 Speed Twin laid the blueprint not only for Triumph's later standard range of bikes like the Bonneville, but also laid the foundation for a motorcycle that had more sporting intentions. The Speed Twin was a 500cc parallel twin that was the first truly successful parallel twin from a British manufacturer. It was such an influential bike that nearly all motorcycles in Great Britain after World War II had a 500cc twin like the Speed Twin. Due to engineering constraints at the time, the 500cc air-cooled parallel twins were about the limit of manufacturing without creating some serious engine vibration. The bike is incredibly iconic and spawned an even more sporting bike, the Tiger 110. The Tiger was a natural evolution of the Speed Twin. It was lighter, had more power, and had some more serious sporting intentions for the late 30s and 40s. However, production had to be seized for civilian use during the wartime efforts starting in 1941. However, these bikes set the stage for what the Triumph brand could be. As most people are aware, in post-World War II, the baby boomers were coming into the fold and enjoying a life that was much more peaceful and prosperous than their predecessors. In the early 1960s, Triumphs became a popular bike for the youth at the time to buy up and convert into cafe racers. And interesting things started to happen as well, with bike enthusiasts blending parts from Triumphs and Nortons, taking good pieces from both manufacturers and creating a best of both worlds approach. The Triton was born, utilizing engines from a Triumph Bonneville and the featherbed frame from a Norton. In 1967 is where we get the first usage of the Daytona namesake. The Daytona name was derived from American rider Buddy Elmore's win at the 1966 Daytona 200 race held at the Daytona International Speedway in Daytona Beach, Florida. The Daytona sacrificed low speed tractability for a pronounced power step at 3500 RPM that helped it compete with advanced designs from Japan. However, the increase in power reduced the life of valve gear, leading to heavy oil consumption, which ironically is a struggle that Triumph has had historically throughout its racing heritage. Don't get me wrong, I love the brand, but data shows us that the motors just aren't as reliable. Triumphs were incredibly popular here in the United States as well, with actors such as Marlon Brando using one in the wild one in. Popular artists at the time, like Bob Dylan, also riding them. It was a brand of adventure excitement with a dash of racing heritage. Time goes on and throughout the 70s, Triumph's business is not doing so hot. Innovation slows compared to other manufacturers and the Japanese ramp up production and start pumping out the UJMs. Triumph finds itself in a bit of a hard spot in terms of finding its place in the market. In fact, the first 600cc Daytona was a bike that never got built due to financial problems at Triumph. The Triumph Daytona 600 was a short stroke sporting version of the 650cc TR65 Thunderbird, an air-cooled parallel twin, but that bike never made it into production. In 1983, Triumph went into receivership, or known as bankruptcy here in the States. John Bluer, a former plasterer who acquired his wealth from building and property development, became interested in keeping the brand alive and bought the name and manufacturing rights from the official receiver. The new company, initially the Bonneville Coventry Limited, ensured that Triumph has produced motorcycles since 1902, winning as a title of the world's longest continuous production motorcycle manufacturer. 
Triumph went through some growing pains in the late 80s and early 90s while they basically started a brand new company from the ground up. It used to be called Triumph Engineering and now it was called Triumph Motorcycles Limited. And they started off with one of the earliest and rarest iterations of the Daytona namesake the Daytona 750, where only 200 were produced. Kicking things off with the newly minted Triumph Motorcycles Limited was the Daytona 750 and 1000, the former being a 750cc triple in a pretty heavy and bulky package, while the latter is a 1000cc four-cylinder answer to, at the time, modern competition. And while they weren't exactly hyper-competitive in the market at the time, Triumph used the platform to iterate and to get better. And while the middleweight offerings took some time to get really better, we're about to see how awful some of the early Daytona middleweights were, the next iteration of a big Daytona was the 955, and that one was a peach. In 1997, the 955 was where Triumph really came into the fold and cemented Triumph's signature triple for the new era. It was received with incredibly positive reviews, mainly for the same reasons that people rant and rave about Triumph's triple nowadays. Excellent torque in the mid-range, supple and predictable handling, and a great build quality. For a while there, the 955 was one of the only modern triples being manufactured. Later, they rolled out the revised edition in 2001 the 955i with more power, lighter weight, and it was Triumph's proper race bike solution. The 955i is a bike I'd actually really love to get my hands on one day, having done research on this bike. It looks like such an awesome old school triple. Fun fact, it actually had one of the most aggressive rakes of any sport bike at the time of its release, which is another Triumph feature, being that the modern day 675 is also one of the most aggressive ergonomics of any middleweight, the Triumph TT600. Here's where Triumph went and tried to compete in what was at the time one of the hottest sport bike markets around, the 600cc class. This was before Triumph realized it was best to place their triple into the middleweight bike and decided to just go head to head and iterate on the four cylinder 600cc sport bike class. However, it was not well received. It had some really anonymous styling, it wasn't offensive, but it wasn't interesting either. The cool thing at least was that it was a brand new motor for a brand new bike as well. At low speeds though, according to reviews, the throttle response wasn't ideal and the fueling was a bit tricky. While the TT600 didn't have the Daytona name slapped anywhere on it, it was definitely a spiritual successor to the modern day Daytona we know. The TT600 could never quite compete with the 600s of its day, however. The 2002 Daytona 600. Look at this little happy face bastard. The Daytona 600 was an updated version of the TT600's engine and was dressed in some new fairings. And while the Daytona 600 had one of the best handling chassis at the time, a feature that can continue to this day with the modern day 675, it was a bike that in isolation was decent, but when compared to other offerings from Japan, it still couldn't quite stack up. Putting out 97 horsepower when the Japanese competition was easily exceeding over 105, it made the Daytona overshadowed, and the fueling was still not quite up to par compared to Japanese competition. Enter 2005 with the Daytona 650. Triumph's final iteration of their four-cylinder Daytona saw them going the Kawasaki route and just bumping the displacement up to 647 cc's, giving the bike the kick in the pants it needed to start competing against the Japanese. Reviews slated that it was more at home on the road than the track, it wasn't quite a replica racer like the R6 or the ZX6R, but the bump in displacement brought the British bike closer to what enthusiasts were seeking at the time. Keep in mind, in the early to mid 2000s, the Supersport CC class was a manufacturer's bread and butter. It was where a majority of sales came from. So for Triumph to solidify their market presence, they had to bring the heat and put out a motorcycle that was a proper Supersport. And in 2006, they did just that by introducing the first generation Daytona 675. Triumph quite literally struck gold with the Daytona 675. Normally a manufacturer creating a bike that was already so close to the competition with the Daytona 650, you'd imagine they create a bike that was simply a model refresh, maybe an update with a few tweaks. But nope, that's not the way Triumph rolls. They put out a brand new, completely revised from the ground up middleweight super sport motorcycle that had a brand new three cylinder engine, razor sharp looks, and undertail exhaust, which was all the rage back in the mid 2000s, and overall one of the greatest motorcycle packages ever created. And that's not just my completely biased opinion, go check out nearly any review of the first generation Daytona 675. It was a breath of fresh air in the marketplace and Triumph finally found their niche. It was in their darling three cylinder bike all along. Gobs of torque in the mid range, a super small and featherweight flickable chassis, the first generation 675 was a total gem and the sales volume backed it up. The bike was a hit and spawned some new diehard Triumph fans, myself included. 
In 2011, they launched the 675R, a factory-ready track weapon with quick shifter, Olin suspension front and rear, and carbon fiber bits all over it. Then in 2013, even though Triumph was riding high with a sport bike that finally kicked him ass, they revised the bike yet again and created the current generation 675. Triumph could have gone the way of Yamaha and held on to the Daytonas from 2006 onward, but in 2013 they rolled out a significantly revised edition of the Daytona. At first glance, it looks like a mild change, but the motor had significant improvements with a 400 RPM breadline bump up to 14,400, several geometry and chassis tweaks such as relocating the exhaust further down, shedding some weight, and making the ergonomics a bit less committed. The latest 675, in my humble and totally non-biased opinion, is a masterpiece. I've ridden lots of different bikes and nothing comes close. It's a perfectly balanced chassis, a complete sweetheart of an engine that sings all the way to redline, a perfect track weapon, and a weekend twisty road carver. It's one of the best bikes ever made. And yes, I'm biased, I own one, whatever. And that's it guys. Thanks for checking out the lineage of the Daytona 675. If you like what you've seen, subscribe to the channel. I'll be pulling out these types of videos every week along with my usual list and comedy videos. I'd love to have you guys join along. I'll see you in the next one.